Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Well, once again, welcome back to the computer security group here at UT Dallas. We are a bunch of nerds who like security. That is us in a nutshell. Uh, before we start our actual presentation for this meeting, two announcements. First one, fire talks. I know my voice is so sultry. You love listening to it, but I don't want to talk all the time. I want to hear you guys talk. I want to hear what you guys know. Try to share something with me, teach me something. That's what fire talks are for. I want you to come up here, give like a five to 10 minute presentation on something that you know. It could be anything security. It could be you did some cool networking stuff or you wrote this cool Python script or maybe a hack. The White House, I don't know. Don't do that last one. We'll probably get arrested for that. But just something in general that you want to share with us. So there is a sign-up link in the Discord on the general channel. It's pinned on there. Just go in there, sign up, put whatever topic you want. We'll be deciding these around, I think, a week or a week and a half before the fire talks actually happen. We'll email who's actually going to be talking, let you guys know so you guys will be prepared for that. Uh, other thing is, there's no meeting next week. Uh, first Wednesday of every month, we're going to DHA. If you don't know what DHA is, it's Dallas Hack Association. It's a cool local event here in Dallas that people that we go to, they do fire talks there as well. So people from the community come up there, talk about something that they've done recently in the security field. It's a lot of fun. I encourage that you come. Uh, they have a meetup meet page online if you Google DHA. All right. So this topic for this meeting is computer networks and network security. Uh, this presentation does have a lot of information in it. I'm going to try to go through it as best I can. There is quite there is questions link, so if you do get confused or lost somewhere in the way, just put a question there, raise your hand, let me know. I'll try to go as slow as possible to make sure that you guys understand the actual information. Uh, what if I'm kind of shy and am too and scared to sign up for a fire talk? Should I still do it? Yes. It may be surprising that in the real world, you're going to have to give a lot of presentations to people. You're going to have to talk to a lot of people and get in front of people that you don't want to. It's scary. It's terrifying. I have big stage fright before I start presenting. I still have some a little bit, but it's a little bit easier to get over for me. But I definitely still recommend signing up. And if you want, you can always put it into the note of your presentation that you are a little nervous talking. You can always email us or hit us up on Discord. We can always come talk to you, help you get over some of your nerves, and maybe help your presentation or your presentation skills before you actually come up here. All right. So as with every presentation, we need a definition. What is a computer network? Well, the actual definition that is given online is, is defined as a digital telecommunication network which allows nodes to share resources. So when we talk about computer networks, we're usually talking about multiple machines creating actual connections or links to each other and being able to exchange data. This is like going into your browser and typing youtube.com. You're creating a connection to YouTube servers trying to get their web page. They're going to send, you're going to send data to them as a request. You're going to, they're going to send data back to you as a response. The links that, that we actually create are physical cables. They could be copper cables, fiber cables, or if you're talking about wireless, this is Wi-Fi, actually sending radio signals over the air. But it seems, it doesn't, it's not that simple as that. It seems a little bit more complicated. But that, if you've ever taken computer networks class, you're probably going to see have seen this picture before. But in comes the OSI model. 
The OSI model stands for the Open Systems Interconnection Model. It's basically a framework or a template that, pe that people have created as a standard for how communication between machines works. Uh, they split up to typically to seven different layers, starting with the physical layer, which is actually figuring out how to put the data onto a physical cable, actually the electrical signal going through that cable, going up from data link to network transport and up and up and up. Uh, from this model, you, you can see that there's layers sandwiched together. The model is set up so that only immediate layers can talk to each other. So the physical layer can only communicate with the data link layer and the data link layer can only talk to the physical and the network layer. The data link layer cannot talk to the application. It cannot skip levels. That is not how this model actually works. And on the left side, it says data and it has a bunch of names. So for each layer, they have a different name for how they classify their data or how they pack it or encapsulate it. So on the physical layer, it's actual bits that they're actually transferring onto the physical cable. When you go up to the data link layer, we usually talk about data as in terms of frames. Network, packets, and transport layer, we call it either, it kind of defers, it's either segments, data streams, or datagrams, depending on what type of protocol you're using at the transport layer. So I'm gonna actually go through only the data link layer, the network layer, and the transport layer, because these are probably the, mo the three most important on it. And it goes from uh, less broad to more broad as you go up the spectrum. Uh... Can I hijack people's radios that are driving near me? Um, if you have the right equipment, technically you could. Uh, I don't recommend doing that while driving. That's probably not a great idea. I don't want to be responsible for that, so I'm not going to advocate that. Why are we taught the OSI model when most applications follow the TCP slash IP model? Well, typically not everything, because the TCP IP model, if you don't know, is under the internet protocol of, or the internet suite. So, and not everything is on the internet. Sometimes we actually interface between machines without trying to talk to the internet. And is, and the TCP IP model is based off the OSI model. So if you wanna actually learn more about the TCP IP model, it's good to have a good understanding how just a computer translates all the information to be transferred over the wire before you understand how the actual internet runs on TCP IP. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the level two area where I'm gonna talk about the MAC layer, which is the medium access control. So the function of this layer is for the reliable transmission for data frames between two nodes connected by a physical layer. In a sense, what I mean by this, it controls the actual transfer of data between two machines connected by a physical cable or multiple cables, and so on and so forth. It's responsible for actually transferring these receiving, receiving and transmitting frames, and for this layer of frames means the actual data. It's also responsible for addressing of destination stations, uh, conveying source station, addressing information, and controlling of access to the actual transmission medium, i.e. the cable or the actual Wi-Fi channel if you're talking about Wi-Fi networks. So when we actually talk about uh, addressing uh, stations, that refers to, as most people would probably know, MAC addresses or the actual uh, media access control number. I'll actually go to that to a second. Last thing is, this is actually the final layer of encapsulation before the actual data is transmitted over the wire. That'll make a little bit more sense later on once I go through the layers. So I'll come back to that. So media access control addresses. I'm pretty sure most of us have seen one of these or have encountered one of these. So it's media access, con uh, access control address of a device is the unique identifier labeled onto the network interface controller. If you've never seen one, that's basically how it looks like. It's six groups of two hexadecimal numbers. So it's about a 48-bit uh, number. Yeah. So, and these numbers are unique to every single network interface controller. So my MAC address is not like any of yours. Your MAC address is unique 
to all of us. Nobody will have the two of the same exact numbers. Think of it as like a social security number for a person. My social security number is not the same as yours and yours is not the same as anybody else's. I can uniquely identify you by this number or address. And if you're wondering how they actually give them a unique, actual manufacturer getting a set of Mac addresses that actually burn into their hardware. What if having two Mac addresses were the same? Well, in manufacturing, it's typically not possible because you're given a set amount of Mac addresses from a uh, committee that actually monitors all these addresses. And so you wouldn't be able to manufacture two machines to have the same address unless there was some kind of mix up, which typically doesn't really happen. Um, there is Mac spoofing, which is a common problem where someone like I try to spoof your Mac address and try to make someone think that the communication coming to them is coming from you. Actually, it's not going to actually like collide information or it's like something's going to like, something's going to explode. Like the routers aren't going to explode. If they see two of the same Mac address coming. It, that's not how it works, but it's, it's basically in the, in the way of it's going to mislead someone if they're looking at this information. So if I see information coming across a wire and I see two same address, I'm going to assume it's coming from the same person, which in reality, sometimes it may not. Is there a way to see through Mac spoofing? Um, from what I've seen, there are, I think there is ways through IPsec to uh, discourage Mac spoofing. I don't know if any techniques off the top of my head exactly. <laughs> is it possible we can see Mac address depletion like what we saw in IPv4? Um, yeah, it is possible, like all things. Everything's finite at some point. It can run out. Um, it's a, they have a little bit more addressing range than IP does. I actually have the exact number. It's about uh, 281,474,976,710,656 actual addresses. It's a large amount, and machines get destroyed, so those MAC addresses get re-released to get burned into another machine. So I don't think it's going to happen too, too soon. Not like IPv4 because it has a smaller address range, but it could run out. So we're going to move to the next layer above data link. So data link layer is going to communicate with this layer, which is called the network layer. This is responsible for structuring and managing a multi-node network. So in this, in this respect, this layer is responsible for I am a machine, I want to send you something, but I don't have a direct link to you. How do I get to you? This is what this layer does. It basically is responsible for figuring out where to put my data and how I actually get my data to you, which is uh, called routing. Routing is actually determining the logical path that data will reach to its destination. And forwarding refers to what's the next hop, where on my actual physical ports, where am I putting your data to be sent off to next? Uh, it provides the functionality and procedures for transferring packets from one node to another. So this basically figures out, I have data, where am I, how do I get to you? So in a sense, this is kind of like, uh, actually that's not a really good analogy. <laughs> uh, you might be familiar with one of the protocols that actually operates on this layer. It is called IP, the Internet Protocol. So, Internet Protocol, you guys interact with it every day. When you type in a website address, it gets translated into an IP address. It is how we actually address machines on the Internet. So, it's the principal communications protocol for relaying datagrams across network boundaries. This is the protocol that's going to figure out how my machine is going to talk to YouTube or Google out in California. It's going to figure out how to get my information from Texas all the way to California. <laughs> it's tasked with delivering packets from data of data from the source host to the destination based on IP address. Uh, if you've never seen IP address, it is the eight, four, four groups of eight bit, eight bit numbers 
that identify a specific host on a network. The IP will encapsulate the application's data with data that is necessary for the packet to be delivered. So when your application generates data that needs to be sent to someone, this layer will actually encapsulate specific data that it needs to know to be able to route your data to wherever it needs to go. It need to be across the country or three feet from you. I don't know where you're sending your data. Uh, IP addressing, um, like I said, I'm pretty sure most of us have seen how what this is, a 32-bit number broken into 8-bit blocks. These actually label machines on a specified network. This is unlike, excuse me, it's unlike MAC addresses, which will universally identify machines anywhere in the world, whereas an IP address will identify it in a certain network. It has different use cases. Uh, it assists with host interface identification and actual locase, location addressing in the actual network. So you can actually set up your IP addresses in your network to be in certain locations. So like, for example, UTD common net always is on 10.21. If you try to connect to common net, you're always going to get a 10.21 address. Uh, machines in ECS are under a 10 dot something number. I don't remember the number exactly. While machines in JSON will be under 10 dot something else. So you can actually def segment your network addresses to be for certain areas. So I know if you give me a number, I'd be like, oh, that's a machine in JSON. I know where that is. And we go up another layer, layer four, the transport layer. This is probably the one that most people have heard protocols from. This is responsible for trans transmitting data segments between points on a network. That kind of sounds like what IP does. Well, the difference between this layer and the IP layer is this layer actually introduced quality of service functions such as flow control, segmentation, and error control. I didn't mention this before, but IP itself is a non-reliable service. What I mean by that is if I send data off somewhere through IP, it doesn't care if it gets there or not. It's just going to send it off and be like, whatever, it's gone. If, it, if they don't receive it or they respond to it, doesn't matter to me. I made my best effort of sending it off. I don't care what happens next. So that's not very good. We kind of want to know if things don't get there so we can send it again. We want we don't want things just dropping. So if like we're streaming a video, if they just start sending video all of a sudden it just drops and I don't know what's going on, that's kind of a problem. Hence why we have this transport layer. And you do things such as acknowledgement of successful transmissions and retransmissions of failed data segments and datagrams. And this picture right here is kind of what I mentioned about encapsulation. So your application generates data specifically for that application. I need to send this data somewhere. So the transport layer is going to take this data and transform it into the specific protocol that it needs to transfer data in, either being usually TCP or UDP, which I'll go over in a second. Then it takes that data and encapsulates that into an IP packet which it appends whatever information it needs to be able to send that off to wherever in the world. Then that information gets put into a frame, which the, the data link layer, layer will also put its own information on the frame to know when, that, when the frame starts and when the frame ends. So as I mentioned, there are two main protocols that come with this layer, most of these you've probably heard of, which is TCP and UDP. Uh, transmission control protocol is a connection-oriented, reliable, ordered, and error-checked delivery of stream octets between hosts. That's a lot of weird words. What do I mean by that? Connection-oriented means when I want to talk to a host, I set up a dedicated connection between them. So I basically reserve this stream saying, hey, this stream is for me and you to talk in and only us. Reliable as in when I send something to you, you're going to tell me that you received it and I'm going to send the next one. It's going to, I'm going to, 
I want to make sure it gets there. And if you tell me I didn't receive anything, I want to make sure I send it back to you again to make sure that you actually got the data. Ordered in, as in, when I send data, I'm going to send it in order. If I, I'm going to start sending you the first part of the message. Once you get that, I'm going to send you the second part of the message and so on and so on until you get everything in the correct order and error checked. Think of YouTube videos or like you're watching Netflix. If I was watching Netflix and I was watching a movie and I started watching the movie and all of a sudden it jumped to the end, I'm going to be pretty pissed. That's not very good service. It's not an order delivery. So when we want like videos and stuff, we kind of want them to play in order. We don't want them, you know, jumping between different segments of the actual video. That's just not really going to do us much good. On the other hand, you have the exact opposite user datagram protocol, which is pretty much the exact opposite of everything I said. It's connectionless, unreliable, unordered, really no error checking. In this example, a lot of live streams will be using this UDP protocol. When you're live streaming, I don't really care if you kind of miss a few frames of what I'm doing. I kind of want you to keep going on. You kind of, you don't want the stream to kind of hold up waiting for something and you have all this stuff, all this correct information kind of piling up. You kind of just want to skip ahead and just pretty much catch up to what I'm doing. So it'll send these, these packets in any order and it's just going to send them off and it's not really going to care if it gets there or not. It's just basically hoping that I send this. I just hope it's going to get there at some point. All right. So now I'm going to do a quick demo. So if you're not completely fam familiar with this program, it's called, this is a program called Wireshark. It is a network analyzer. So basically it's going to analyze all of the packets, data frames that are coming to my machine and display all the information in here. It's basically going to sniff on my wireless card and display all of the data that's coming into that card. So I'm going to tell him to capture on this address and blow it up a little. All right. So from what you've seen now, there is a lot of stuff going on. My machine is talking to a lot of things. I'm going to stop this right now. So within that last couple of seconds, my machine received about 11,000 packets. That is a decent amount. It's mostly because I'm live streaming, so it's sending a lot of data out. But we can see a lot of information that's coming into my machine. So we can determine since when I started, how much time has lasted since I actually received that packet, where that packet came from and where that packet is destined to, the actual protocol that this packet is following, how big this packet was and extra information about it. So my IP address is 10.21.79.39. We can probably see that a lot of these packets are coming from me due to me live streaming, but this can show a lot of stuff that's going on in your machine or at least the data I'm receiving. So if I were to click on a packet, I can see all the layers of data that I just mentioned. We can see the frame, which is the data link layers information. I can see the internet protocol version, which is your third layers of information. And then I can see the TCP protocol. So I can see lots of different information that is coming at each layer of this protocol. So if I click frame, I can see when it actually arrived, what frame number is, what the frame length was. And if I were to go to IP protocol, I can see what kind of flags were all. I can see the time to live value, how long this packet could travel before it gives up and what protocol this packet is using, the source that it came from and where it's destined to. And then I can see where TCP information that I need. So it's, it's good for trying to determine if maybe you're trying to communicate with something it's not going out for some reason. Maybe I need to look at what's going on. You could run this on your machine and figure out, are my packets actually failing? So we can figure out, we can specify what kind of packets I wanna look for. So let's say I wanna look for DNS packets. 
And this will actually filter out everything that I was sniffing earlier for only DNS packets. So it's good if you want to narrow down, like for some reason, I'm not getting the right IP address when I'm typing in a domain name. I can look at my DNS requests and, God dang it. <laughs> Yippee. <laughs> one second. Uh, no, no, Whatever. So we can filter out certain requests to figure out exactly what we're looking for. It's a very strong tool. A lot of network engineers learn it. If you're wanting to get any type of networking job and network engineering, network security, anything like that, you're probably going to want to learn this tool. Employers really look for people who know how to use Wireshark well. If you know how to filter correctly or look through these packets for information correctly, they will very much like to hire you. All right. Oop. Oh, wrong one. No, it'd be good if I know what these were. All right. Questions? No questions? Oh, well. questions are quiet tonight. But what about security? We're the computer security group. I want to know why this stuff is insecure. Well, you, if you're listening to me, you probably noticed I didn't mention anything about security. None of these, this OSI thing, it's not developed to be secure. It's just developed to make sure that your data gets to one place or another. They don't care if someone's listening in, realizing you're looking up weird videos on YouTube. They don't really care. This is where the security part comes in. But when we talk about network security, it's kind of a broad topic. There's a lot of different areas in network security from the security of the IP layer protocol, DN domain name resolution security, preventing malware on your network, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, network segmentation. There is a bunch of different things. So if you're looking to go into network security as a career, good for you. There's a lot of stuff you can do. That's a good choice to go into. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go into everything in network security because it's just kind of too raw of a topic. I am going to go into one field that I've personally have experience in, which is malware prevention. I'm pretty sure most of us know what malware is. If you don't like it, I don't want to pay money for you to unencrypt my laptop. That is dumb. So we need to prevent it from actually getting onto our network in the first place. So malware prevention is basically the field of setting up your infrastructure to identify and detect and get rid of these types of intrusions on your network. Usually you find these by looking at your network and finding malicious traffic or maybe malicious behavior coming from a machine. Different signs of this happening on a network are machines communicating to an outside source constantly a la command and conquer servers. If we have a machine here on campus and I realize it's talking to Russia a lot, I think that computer's a Russian agent. I'm probably gonna kill it. That's kind of a bad thing. Uh, local machines communicating between each other when they're not known to. So if I have like a research machine here in ECS that doesn't communicate with the outside world and for some reason started talking to Russia, I wanna think that's kind of weird or they start talking to a machine in a different building that's not supposed to do that. Red flags, not something I want to. And out of the ordinary traffic, again, Russian websites, they're sketchy, don't go to them, please. These are typically things that we see when something is not right. We might wanna look into this machine. Um, these are some kind of the well-known viruses that have come around over the ages. Uh, crypto logger was a big crypto virus that cost a bunch of people a lot of money. Um, I Love You is one of the fastest spreading pieces of malware known to man. This what kind of came out towards the birth of email. So that's, since we didn't really understand how email <coughs> worked super well, it spread incredibly fast. Uh, My Doom was another virus that's spread incredibly fast through the use of email. Uh, Stormworm, Zeus Trojan, which is a banking Trojan. Emotet, also another banking Trojan. And probably the most infamous one is Stuxnet. Uh, if you're 
taking any kind of ethics course here, you're probably going to be covering Stuxnet. Um, to make a long story short, uh, U.S. government developed a virus that basically destroyed all of Iran's nuclear program. So if you want to know about that, I would Google that. <laughs> And I want to go into talk about one virus in particular. This one I have a lot of experience with because I, I used to work at the university. University got hit a couple of times with this virus. And instead of me explaining it, I'm going to let the actual uh, government explain it. So Emotet is a banking trojan. It gets on your machine it locks it and it basically crawls your machine trying to find banking information and exploit your banking information into your accounts. This one is kind of kind of a hard one. It is very aggressive, as we want to say. So as it states, most of these infections usually cost about a million dollars per incident. When this um, this this virus is polymorphic, so it evades signatures a lot. So basically it changes itself a little bit every time it spreads. So you re can't really get a good feel of, is this it? I'm not really too sure because it's not like the last one we saw. It's a little bit different. It's also known for uh, being virtual uh, environment aware. So if you try to analyze this thing in a virtual machine, uh, it's probably not going to run because it's going to find out it's in a virtual machine and Try, not trying to run because it doesn't want you to actually look at what it does. It's trying to hide from you. Uh, so it gives you a little image. That's basically what happens. This is like a email that usually comes through an email and this is what the email will kind of look like. It'll also come with an attachment of a Word document and that's how it spreads. So they give us this nice little diagram. So Usually comes in with an invoice and shipment saying, hey, your item shipped. Here's an invoice through a PDF or a Word document. It basically has a malicious macro in there that when you open this document, it's going to run immediately, reach out to its uh, command server, and download that virus onto your machine. That virus is then going to register auto start keys. So if you shut your computer off, turn it back on, it's just going to run immediately again. And then once it goes from there, it contacts its command server asking, what do I do now? Command server sends instructions back and it's basically going to scrape your machine for any type of credentials, bank logins, any type of networking information it can find to propagate outwards. So it's a banking trojan with a little bit of worm tendencies inside of it. And it goes on to talk about the impact, how actually infects and different solutions to doing it. So from this, you can probably kind of tell um, people make some really bad viruses. There are some pretty bad hombres, if you want to say, <laughs> <laughs> quoting our president. Um, so ne network security in the terms of trying to prevent malware is a huge concern for people. We really want don't want these viruses in there. Because as we've seen from time and time again, um, people are stupid. People infect their computers a lot on purpose because they don't understand that they can get infected in a certain way. They see an email, they freak out and open things and boom, now your whole entire computer is encrypted. People are kind of dumb. So we kind of want to develop these network infrastructures to prevent them from preventing these viruses from getting to them in the first place. Uh, all right. So summing all up some quick resources for anybody wanting to learn more about computer networks or network security in general, um, Hack the Box is a great place to learn how to manipulate networks. It's a penetration web, uh, offensive penetration website where there's a bunch of machines put up and you basically have to break into them or hack into them. Most of them will involve some kind of network manipulation. Some might be multiple machines connected to each other, and you have to pivot across the network onto multiple machines to be able to get access to them. So if you're trying to learn how the, how networks work or how to manipulate them or, in a sense, try to break them, great website to join. 
Uh, SANS.org. SANS is a an institution known for doing a lot of security training. It's very well revered. They have some free resources on network security. So if you want to read up on a little bit on that, it's always a good read. Uh, a book recommendation, Hacking the Art of Exploitation. It's a good book. It doesn't talk specifically about network security, but it does touch on that as a topic. It's a good read if you actually want to look into that. Uh, for tools, as I presented, Wireshark, it's a good for analyzing what kind of data is coming in between your machine. You could also plot that on a machine in the middle of a network and look at all the traffic coming to that machine. You can put on a router and see what's going on in that router. Um, Nessus is a vulnerability scanner. So basically you can target a machine on a network and scan that entire machine, trying to find some kind of vulnerability that might be exposed on it. It's good if you're trying to secure your machine. It's good if you're trying to break into the machine. Whatever you want to use it for, go for it. But have permission first. Don't just go scanning things, please. You didn't hear that from me. Um, Aircrack NG is a tool suite used for breaking into wireless networks. So cracking wireless keys and stuff like that. Um, Snort is sort of like Wireshark. It's a packet analyzer. If you're really good at setting it up, you could probably set it up to um, be an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system. So when traffic comes in, you look at it. If it looks kind of sketchy, you throw it out or prevent it from getting to your source or finding out that, hey, this traffic that's coming towards us is malicious. Uh, let's see, do I have any more questions? Uh, what is a site that has the malware write-ups? How does CISA relate to the government? So CISA is the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember the acronym super well. It is the, it's a cyber, uh, cybersecurity branch of the government. So they're basically they're concerned with different security flaws that might present themselves, either system security and network security. It's a very broad side of the government. It's their website. I don't know what the actual um, URL was, but if you just Google CISA, you will probably find their website and they usually publish, if it's a well-known virus, they'll probably publish an article on that, letting people know. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions that you want to shout at me? Eh, there's nothing more than it's all. Oh, what are the legal penalties for hacking? No, <laughs> well, short version, it's illegal most of the time. Don't do it. Long story, the statutes for cyber crime is kind of, it fluctuates between state to state. There is no federal laws for for that governs all cyber hacking, but in general, most states, it depends on the level of the hacking because they some states classify different types of hacking as <laughs> different levels of felonies. Most of the time, most hacking incidents, you're still looking at like four to five years in prison for and most types of hacking. It depends how the state classifies it as, since there is no federal law against it. Just don't get caught. I'm just going to add on to that. There is no statute of limitations if you hack any sort of government, regardless of. If you even attempt to hack any sort of government facilities, there's no statute of limitations. <laughs> 20 years later, it will get you for it. Fun fact. That being said, well, you, want, you want to talk about how well, they don't say DHA? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, First rule of DHA is don't hack the venue. They get really pissed off if you do that. You'll probably get banned from there if you do that. So mind your targets well. Um, fun fact, the I love you virus, that the one I said that was the fastest spreading virus ever. Um, when they actually did that, there were no laws against cyber hacking, so they never got tried and they got let off. <laughs> don't, don't hack the venue. So yeah, uh, to put it nicely, uh, don't crap or eat, in a sense. <laughs> um, they have a whole pipeline of curators 
interested in actually the Book and Act government stuff. Um, research it. The state of Texas now kind of encourages people to do some penetration tests to get their stuff, but you need to read rules to make sure you're doing it legally. But there's things like bug bounties that are hmm. really common. If you're interested in actually hacking and learning how to do that, uh, bug bounties are shown in like all sorts of websites that uh, will pay you if you actually find a vulnerability. But again, you have to, you have to play by their rules if you want to do it. You apply know, that style. There's also like offline hacking, so like breaking into hardware and trying to find vulnerabilities in that. There's also responsible disclosure, disclosing to the vendor first that you found this vulnerability for, shout, going out and shouting at the world, I can get in here and everything and all that kind of stuff. So there is there's different ways of responsible and ethical hacking, depending on where you actually want to go. What are the biggest security problems at the moment? Uh, there's a lot. It depends what type of security you're talking about. I mean, network security, there's always problems to solve because people are always developing new ways to find a way around it. We're trying to find better ways to make our firewall so we can catch everything coming in. We're trying to make sure that when people aren't putting, you know, malicious routers on our network, trying to hijack all of our traffic towards it, there's lots of different security problems at the moment. In terms of biggest, that's kind of relative to how you see it, I guess. I can't really find a single issue and say, that's the biggest problem we have at this point. We need to fix this. There's just a bunch and we kind of need to fix them all in a sense. Uh, any other questions? Uh, it's not really a question, but you can color code the traffic coming through Wireshark also. Yeah, there are, there is coloring rules, so you can make custom colors and stuff like that. Those are just the default colors that I just didn't feel like changing. <laughs> oh, that's all. I, that's all I got for you guys. So.